I must say, David, right off the very top, I'm very impressed by your new solo album, Secrets of the Beehive. Thank you. I like it very, very much. The one thing I noticed, David, is that the overall mood of the new album is much more relaxed than any of your previous work, either solo or with Japan. Why is that? Uh, it's hard to say. Um, it came out of a, a period of in time when um, it just seemed to be the mood I was in. The material was written in a very short period of time, so it definitely does reflect a certain frame of mind. Um, I think also it, it balances the lyrics in some way because there's a certain amount of uh, of uh, tension, of darkness, in some way in the lyrics, and in some way the the music balances that out by being um, so mellow. In, in atmosphere. Do you find yourself working like that uh, often? In what? How do you mean? Well, uh, I take for example uh, s some of your previous work. Uh, let's take for example your last album, Gone to Earth. Uh, there seemed to be uh, somewhat. Uh, there seemed to be tension in the lyrics, but yet the music seemed to smooth out that tension. I think you have to uh, strike a balance. With, with with work you're doing. I mean, if I'm writing a love song, for example, which is is relatively straightforward, I'll try and inject some kind of tension into the music so that it doesn't fall into that very easy listening category. Because I don't think um, I ever really feel that way. I'm, I'm I'm never a person that sits back and feels very comfortable with life. If I'm happy, there's always an undertone of of doubt, of nervousness, of sadness, or whatever and vice versa. So I try to strike that balance in the music somehow, and, and, and it really all depends where the, where the emphasis lay in, in the music, you know, that you have to uh, answer that in some way. That's a very interesting approach to music. That's uh, the first time I've, I've heard of a songwriter uh, describing it that way, and it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Well, it does, because you never really do feel... Um, solely one emotion uh, you, you, you're always an emotion is always accompanied by other emotions you know whether it's a, whether it's the opposite or whether it's just accompanied by shades of the same emotion or whatever it's never purely joy or sadness or, or whatever it's it always has these undertones and I think that should 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 be reflected in, in, in the work I do I also noticed that the, the style and delivery of your singing is even more relaxed than ever. Now, is that a reflection of the music on the album, or is that a craft that you developed for yourself? I think it's just the way that's become um, very natural for me. Uh, I feel very comfortable singing that way. I like the idea of the... the because the, the, the melodies are, are quite simplistic, the song structures are quite simplistic, I wanted to make the whole feeling of the music very intimate. And therefore, I wanted to sing, sing very um, close to mic, very, very uh, in a lower register for me, so that there's a feeling of intimacy. So it's because there's something very personal. Well, there's a great deal very personal in the in the lyrical content, and I wanted to put that over in some way. And and it also, obviously, because of the music, the music was very mellow in many ways, and I wanted to reflect that, you know, in the vocal performances. Critics have often compared your vocals to the likes of David Bowie and Brian Ferry. Who would you say are your influences in that department? Um, God, it's difficult to say nowadays. Definitely in the early days, Ferry and Bowie were influences uh, when I first started. Um, as time's gone on, I've found very few vocalists that I ad admire that, that to that degree. Uh, I've, I know that I've developed a style now that I can call my own. I guess if there's there's people that I admire, it would be people like... Um, probably doesn't reflect the, the, my own vocals. There's people like Robert Wyatt and Tom Waits, uh, Nick Drake, Tim Buckley, Scott Walker, people like that. On your last album, Gone to Earth, you collaborated with Bill Nelson and Robert Fripp. I found that uh, a very unique combination, one that sort of took me by surprise. It was the least of which I expected. How did that opportunity come about? Um, well, it, it happened over a long period of time. I met Bill before I started recording the album, and we talked a great deal and found we had a lot of things in common, you know. Um, and it, I, I kept him in my mind when I was when I was thinking of guitarists to work with. I mean, I've admired his work for many, many years. 
what happened was that I was working on the material for Gone to Earth and I realized that I wanted to make it um, a guitar orientated album and so the, it was like Bill was one of the first people to come to mind um, and as I was working on one of the pieces on the album called Wave I'd gone through uh, many many soloists trying to find the right instrument to break up the very structure structured um, composition uh, I wanted an in somebody that could come along and improvise throughout the piece and break up the form somehow and I tried these various instruments and I was having no luck at all and late one evening I was just sitting back totally despondent wondering what what I, who what what kind of instrument I could use and Robert's uh, guitar sound came to mind and I thought well that would be wonderful that would be perfect and fortunately he was in London at the time and came up the next evening and and uh, recorded the take in, in in the first and second takes or something like that and that, that's the start of the relationship. And then I'd only written half the album, so I went back and as I was rewriting material for the album, I kept the two guitarists in mind and wrote for them. So it was kind of luck, luck for me. I mean, I'm, I'm very lucky anyway. I mean, I, I, whenever I ask people to, to come and work with me, the people that I've admired for many years, I've been very lucky they've you know, agreed to come along and work with me. So I'm, I'm in a very fortunate position there. It's what really whatever the arrangement dictates, you know. I, I, when I'm working on the arrangements of the pieces, they generally cry out a name, you know. And, and, and I, I think, well, yes, that, that, that person will be perfect for this piece of music. And, and they generally agree to work with me. So, you know, it's, it's incredibly fortunate. You said that the, the object, one of the objectives of uh, the making of Gone to Earth was to make a more guitar oriented album. Is that why, why one of the reasons? that uh, the, the second disc in the album is, is all instrumental. Sorry, could, could you repeat that? You, you said that uh, you wanted to make a much more guitar-oriented album with Gone to Earth. Is that one of the reasons why uh, the second disc in the album is, is all instrumental? Um, well, that came about because um, I found a kind of system of, uh, of writing those instrumental pieces uh, made up of, uh, of tape loops and guitar loops and it was fascinating for me so i just pursued it and i wrote uh, i don't know maybe 30 or 40 of, the, of those pieces uh, at the same time as i was writing the songs and they belong together you know i didn't want to separate the ideas separate them as albums yes but they they belong together there's still a continuity that runs throughout the two albums so um it was just an idea that i wanted to pursue make uh, writing uh, based on these guitar loops it was also nice to hear you working with Mick Karn on his last solo album. Has there ever been a thought to reform Japan? There was at one point, um, just before actually I started working with Mick. That's how it came about. He uh, invited all the the guys in the band round to his place, and 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 we we sat down and actually spoke about you know the idea of reforming the band, and um, basically agreed that it wasn't a very good idea, um, that it would be. A, a, a retrogressive step that that uh, we were doing uh, more interesting work in our own careers than we had ever done with Japan, and that it was worth pursuing those ideas rather than reforming. And at the end of that evening, uh, Mick said to me, "Well, you know, if the band's not getting together, you know, what about working together on, on on a few ideas or a few projects?" And he was currently writing his album at that point in time, and he wanted just a couple of vocal tracks on the album and he wanted me to write lyrics for them so uh, that's how that came about you know out of that discussion you've worked with uh, various other artists in, in collaborative efforts uh, Ryuichi Sakamoto for another example uh, Mark Isham uh, do you enjoy collaborating with other musicians yes very much very much otherwise sometimes the recording can just become a very technical uh, exercise if you have very strong ideas of, about what you want when you go into the studio there's no room for for improvising for ideas to come into play while recording so what i try to do is leave the arrangements of the pieces very open in the studio and and let the collaboration start there so that people come into the studio and have a greater input than they would otherwise um, it's very very important for me it's, it's a fascinating uh, exercise uh, to do that in the studio. Otherwise, as I say, the whole thing would become very, very technical 
in approach. It would just be a matter of reproducing original ideas I had previously. Is that one of the exercises that uh, you followed when when writing music and when working with the members of Japan? It's it, the music of Japan sounded so progressive for its age for for that particular era. It sounded like there there seemed to be a, such an open atmosphere in the studio that ideas just seemed to bounce off of each other. Well, that's true. Yeah, I mean, Japan was definitely a group. You know, I wrote the majority of the material, but. Uh, when it came to the arrangements, it was all of us working together, you know, to get the best out of the music. And uh, yes, I think that's where my, that's where my basis comes from. You know, that's, that that was my learning period. I learned a great deal working with members of Japan, and in many ways, I still pursue um, the the ideas that I that that came into play at that point in time. It's very much like. Um, very much like being a film director, uh, the, the kind of director that writes the scripts, uh, is, uh, directs the film, and plays the leading role. You just surround yourself with really good actors uh, to, to, to support that performance and, uh, and really just interact off of those performances and, until something gels, you know, until something special begins to take place. I've always seen it in that light. Well, I have to thank you for virtually introducing my next question. Um, here's a collaboration that has nothing to do with music. Steel Cathedrals, a film by David Sylvian and Y. Yamaguchi. Uh, have you a desire to work more in filmmaking? Not really. Um, I, I find that there's so many musical ideas that I really don't have time to get around to, to uh, elaborating on that, that I, I really don't want to move into other areas. You know, I'd much rather concentrate on, on, on composition and so on. I, I enjoyed doing that film very much, and there are ideas that I do have for film, but um, it, take, it definitely takes second place to the music. I am interested in doing soundtracks for film, uh, but um, I, I, I get offered quite a lot of scripts, but I, I haven't really come across a script that, that is suitable for me, one that I really um, think is special, you know, that I, I would like to take time out for. Have you any aspirations to uh, pursue any acting? No, none at all. Let's talk about Japan just for one more second. Uh, one question, being a big fan of the music of Japan, uh, there's been a sort of a question lurking in the back of my mind for many years. And now that I have the opportunity to ask you over the phone, why was there such a radical change in the group's sound from obscure alternatives to quiet life? <laughs> um. Well, there are quite a number of reasons why that happened. Um, there was uh, there was a great deal of pressure on the group before, pre, well, pre-Quiet Life, and uh, we had signed to a record company that basically signed us on the basis of uh, the image of the band. And we'd spent a year in the studio prior to recording our first album, just trying to satisfy the record company that they had, you know, done the right thing by signing us. Um, actually going, uh, uh, recording demo after demo, um, trying to please different people, management, record company, and so on. And when we, be when we made our first album, it was under extreme pressure. It was like, well, look, you know, you don't like any demos we've made, and that was, those, these demos were just to please you. L just let us go in the studio and record ha what we want to, you know. But I think what came out was um, very caricatured, uh, we were working with a producer that had no idea what we were trying to do and, and, and accentuated sides of the band which, which had nothing to do with what, what we were aiming towards. We were very young. We made many mistakes ourselves. That goes without saying, I think. What happened after that, we made the second album very quickly after the first because we felt, well, that was a, a great mistake um, and people are going to judge us on the album. We've got to get the second one out quickly. And that was a mistake. Um, so after the second album, we were very unhappy with what we had done. We uh, were on the point of breaking up. We spent six months talking about that, you know, whether we would break up or whether we could change radically enough to push ourselves into a new direction w which we would feel happy pursuing. And fortunately, we managed to do that in some, in some way with Quiet Life. We found a producer that liked and understood what we were trying to do. I started writing um, songs that weren't escapists from my point of view so much they were based on the aspects of my my character and therefore rang true in with in certain elements 
and uh, and that's when things began to take shape. I mean, it was a, a massive step. I mean, and still now, if you ask any of the members of Japan, they'd all say that that Quiet Life was the first Japan album because it was the first one that we ever had the kind of um, understanding in ourselves of, of the kind of direction we wanted to go in, and was surrounded by people that cared and understood what we were trying to do. So um, it is a radical change. You had much more freedom then, too. We did, yes. Oil on Canvas is an excellent testament to Japan's live sound. Um, was it the strain of live work that led to the breakup of the group? No, we never did that much live work. Um, in fact, it, was, it may be the opposite that, that led to the breakup. I never used to like to tour, and it was only like my way of compromising with the other members of the band that that loved to tour that, that, that we ever actually got out on the road and we the tours were kept down to the minimum um, there was many reasons again for the breakup but basically it was that it had reached a point where it just could go on no longer um, we found that we couldn't there was no way we would get back in the studio with one another because it would be too difficult to continue we all had different, well, mainly between me and Mick, we had very different ideas about what the way we should be heading musically. And uh, Mick also decided at that point that he wanted to make a solo album. And there was a kind of unspoken rule within the members of Japan that no album, no solo album should be made while the group existed. So to um, accentuate the kind of tension within the band and hopefully produce greater material. Um, and I asked Nick at that point, you know, well, what do you want? Do you want the solo album? Do you want do you want Japan? You know, you have to make a decision. And he couldn't make a decision. He wanted both. And so I I kind of made the decision for him. I knew that there was no point in stopping him making that album that he wanted to make. And um, in a way, it was the right time. Japan had reached a peak, and it was uh, in, in in a way in keeping with Japan's history to to break it up at that point. You know, it was aesthetically pleasing to break up a group when it was at its peak and therefore it just it just had to happen well, thank you for answering those questions about japan i didn't know whether you would uh, feel comfortable over talking about japan or not oh it's fine by me you know i'm i'm proud of some of the things japan did and um i, I see no harm in going back over it if you were to select what's your favorite japan album okay now that we have uh, we've come to the conclusion that japan Quiet Life is considered the first Japan album by the members uh, of Japan. Quiet Life, Gentlemen Take Polaroids, or Tin Drum, which would you say is the most satisfying, satisfying recording that uh, the group made? I think Tin Drum, but uh, Quiet Life was the happiest album. I mean, we definitely enjoyed making that album. Um, but Tin Drum is, is, most, is the most musically uh, successful. It, it, it moved into some new areas with uh, with electronic music that, that hadn't been really covered before in pop music. So I think in that respect, it will be the longest standing album. I, as a matter of fact, uh, just two nights ago, I, I was laying on the couch at home and listening to Tin Drum on, on the headphones. And I thought to myself, gee, the percussion in that particular album uh, seemed to play a big part in the whole direction of that album. Mm -hmm. Uh, Steve Jansen was uh, was the percussions for the group at that particular time. Did you, when you wrote the music for Tin Drum, were you, uh, how should I put it? Um, well, uh, when I listened to the album again, I came to the conclusion it had a much more Oriental feel to it. Mm. Uh, was that the objective when writing that music? Not really. No. Um, the idea was uh, uh, basically the idea behind the album was the arrangements of the pieces. I had the idea that we should strip everything down to uh, uh, kind of bare minimum and then break up the melody lines of, uh, uh, of, of all the keyboards, for example, and, and record them with, with different sounds so that um, it, was, it would become very fragmented in a way, but, but it would be very interesting from a production point of view to, to put these pieces together. And that started with Talking Drum, which remains one of my favorite pieces uh, that Japan ever recorded. Um, that really emphasized, that, that was the first track we recorded and that was the kind of guideline for the rest of the album. It was every alternate phrase should be played with a different sound. Uh, and uh, and that, that, that was the point of reference. 
Um, the Oriental side came into it because Steve and I were listening, Steve Jansen and I were listening to a lot of uh, Chinese music at that point in time, uh, Chinese traditional music, and that kind of just crept into to, to the overall um, uh, concept of, 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 of the album. But it wasn't really planned that much in advance, and sometimes I feel that um, too much stress is, is, is placed on that side of... of of the album, you know, I don't really think it's as there are that many references to to uh, Oriental traditional music as as much as maybe people think. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. I'm glad I'm glad you uh, clarified that for me. That's uh, another thing that's been sort of lurking in the back of my head for for quite some time. Um, you you talked uh, a while back about uh, working with people that you admired, and you had mentioned Robert Fripp and uh, and Bill Nelson. Are there anybody else uh, that you'd like to to work with in the future? I guess there are, you know, but I, I really don't have a list of people that, you know, I think, well, yes, that's, you know, the, the, I've got to work with that person at some point. As I said, it's the arrangements of the pieces that cry out for a, a certain style of playing. And uh, then I'll just go through my mind, um, like in, in reference of, of people that I like and admire and, and look for that sound, you know. Um, so... Yes, in the end, I end up working with people that I'm familiar with, whose music I admire, just because that's the only music I know. Um, and I'm reluctant to work with session musicians. So um, there are people I want to work with, but I don't actually make a point of writing material specifically for those people, unless we've already started collaborating, as in the case with Robert Fripp. What sort of direction is David Sylvian going to take on his next solo album? Are, are we talking a little premature right now? I think so, because whatever I say, there's no guarantee that you know that's the way the album's going to sound. Because I think it's going to be some time before I actually get around to recording the next album. I'll be I'll be touring next year, um, more than likely, and I think that that would be taking up a great deal of my time, and therefore. Um, my my next album, uh, studio album, probably wouldn't be released until uh, possibly this time next year, maybe even later. Correct me if I'm wrong, is this the first time you're touring live as a solo artist? Yes, it is. What made you decide to hit the road, so to speak? Well, after the Japan split up, I, I kind of promised myself that I wouldn't even think about touring until I'd made my third solo album because by that point I thought the people, what well, I would have found a musical direction of my own. Mm -hmm. And uh, and maybe by that point I thought, well, it would be a good time to take a break from recording and, uh, and go on the road. Um, I also thought that the audience wouldn't be coming along with like preconceived ideas of, of, of what to expect, or maybe expecting another kind of Japan-style performance, which, which is really something I never enjoyed anyway, and I didn't want people coming along and being disappointed. And also to really find out whether I would miss it or not, um, and I and I must admit I don't <laughs> in many ways. Um, but I, I thought it's a good time to, to 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 take it on and find out just how I respond to to that experience, whether I enjoy it or not. I know that it's going to be rewarding in some way. I know I'm going to react in some way, positive or negative. It will help me to view my own material in a different light and poss possibly push me on to um, in a different direction for the next studio work, you know. Um, it's just like a stimulus in some way. Um, I could go on writing material. I've got many, as I said, there's many ideas that I have yet to follow up on. But um, I don't really want to go straight back into the studio. I think it's time to, take, to sit back and, and take a look at what I'm doing instead of just you know, sitting around for, for a few months, I decided to, to go out on tour instead. Do you have any other interests? Hobbies, shall we say? Um, I guess, yes, I guess I do. I mean, I read a great deal. I, 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 I love traveling. I love going to galleries. Um, I love drawing. Uh, yeah, there's, there's many things that I, I enjoy. Um, things that I don't normally have that much time for, especially over the past couple of years, and that's, that's why I wanted to actually take a break away from that recording, because I felt I haven't really lived a normal life for the past few years, and, and the, the, the work may suffer because of that. Well, you certainly have been uh, quite prolific with your work in the last couple of years, and I wish you all the best of luck. 
in the future, David. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank you very much for taking the time for to do this interview. I know you just arrived into Toronto virtually a few hours ago, and uh, I'm glad you, you took the time after settling in to do the interview. It's been uh, quite an honor talking to you. As I, as I had mentioned, I am a very big fan of yours, and I've always been a big fan of Japan. And, uh, well, again, thanks very much for doing the interview with me tonight, David. It was a pleasure. Okay, then. Have yourself a wonderful time in Toronto. Thank you. Okay, then. Bye-bye.